what I'm going to show you has been acquired with rather modest telescopes compared to the fantastic machines that Jim just described. <clears throat> so the topic is dark gas in the galaxy, and uh, it's a little different. The title of this talk in your program says molecular gas, so we'll get to that later. But for the moment, uh, I won't uh, color it by suggesting what it might be. We'll just look at what the evidence is. I want to go through um, a, a number of different results that we've gotten uh, from other people, and then to describe in more detail um, something that we've been doing ourselves uh, with modest telescopes. Okay, so the first th thing I thought would be useful to talk about is to just review briefly, for those of you in the audience that are not experts in this subject, the um, tracers that we've used traditionally to trace the interstellar gas in the galaxy and the nearby galaxies, and tell you about some recent results that have been obtained largely through the advent of new results, um, of new measurement techniques um, that have come brought dark gas to light in the neighborhood of the sun. And then I want to move on to something that we have specifically contributed, my co-authors and I, about thermal OH emission, um, a surprising observation that we made, uh, which I didn't understand when we first made it, and I think it has a connection to this dark gas, and I hope to convince you of that connection as we go along. And then mention a few things about some next steps we might take uh, in the near future. Now, I realize this is going to be a challenge because it's getting late and we've had a big lunch. And so this is about the time that everybody falls asleep. And uh, I'll do my best to keep you awake, especially Frank, who was already uh, <laughs> nodding off there. Um, the traditional tracers of um, uh, gas in the galaxy is the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen, which has been known, of course, for a long time, and which I would say something you should file away in the back reaches of your memory, that everybody and his brother assumes is optically thin. And I think there's really little evidence for that. But we'll get back to that near the end. The second is the tracer of molecules. The canonical tracer is the three millimeter line of molecular carbon monoxide. And this line too has been interpreted as essentially the sole indicator of molecular gas in, gal in our galaxy and in nearby galaxies. And we're going to see what the problems are with those observations, <clears throat> with those assumptions. And then thirdly, there's the thermal infrared emission uh, from warm dust, which was first made popular by IRAS observations um, around the sort of 100 micron wavelength range. And those were the tracers we had, those three, and they have essentially built for us the edifice we have of the distribution and the characteristics of interstellar gas in galaxies on the large scale are based on these tracers. There's recently, there's been some new tracers that are new kids on the block. And these new tracers are showing us, as you might perhaps shouldn't be surprised, some new things. Uh, the first is that the wavelength at which we've been able to study the continuum emission, the thermal emission, has been moving from the infrared down to lower wavelengths. And we're down into the millimeter range even right now. And that dust is cool. And that dust was essentially invisible, or perhaps a better way to describe it is that it was blinded. We were blinded about the presence of that dust by the, uh, by the 100 micron emission from much smaller quantities of much warmer gas. Of course, it's a t to the fourth thing. And so uh, if you have somewhat warmer gas, you need much less of it to essentially give you a blinding image. And so that's why uh, that information from cool dust is so much uh, more valuable than you might simply think from uh, the energy content of that dust. And then finally, something that is really quite new that I will start off with is gamma ray emission from collisions of cosmic rays with the interstellar matter uh, in the galaxy. And this is fairly recent and 
refers to local gas, but there's no reason to suspect that there should be any difference between the local gas and gas elsewhere in the galaxy. And this emission comes, of course, from energetic uh, cosmic rays that collide with um, material in, in the interstellar matter, no matter what it is. So it doesn't matter whether it's dust or gas or whatever, uh, you're going to get gamma ray emission when those uh, particles collide with uh, that material. And so it, it, it's essentially a, uh, a, an indicator of stuff that's there without being specific about what that stuff might be. Here's the first result that I want you to cogitate here, uh, which I think, in my personal opinion, is a remarkable discovery that's come about. It's now uh, getting on to be eight years old, but nevertheless, I'm astounded when I read this. Um, these uh, workers took uh, observations of the interstellar gas tracers that I mentioned, H1 and CO lines from atomic and molecular gas, <clears throat> the dust thermal emission, and gamma rays from cosmic ray interactions, and they have evidence in this paper for vast clouds of coal dust and dark gas invisible in H1 and CO and detected in gamma rays. They surround all nearby CO clouds and bridge the dense cores to broader atomic clouds, and providing a key link to the evolution of interstellar clouds. Now, uh, this is, this is an, an amazing result, and I just want to show you a few pictures from this paper uh, by Grenier et al. in Science. This shows a sky map of um, the excess dust reddening. The way this is calculated essentially is to model the uh, distribution of um, uh, reddening uh, as if it was correlated linearly with the integrated CO and integrated H1 along lines of sight. And you then use uh, linear estimates from those gas tracers as to what the dust content ought to be. And then you go out and measure it, and you discover that there's more reddening there than would be indicated. So it's a very simple measurement, but nonetheless, they took the trouble of doing it over the whole sky. So this shows in areas like this, these regions at what appears to be high latitudes are actually quite close to the sun. And so this is all rather, rather local gas in, uh, in the galaxy. <clears throat> There's another plot looks somewhat like this, which is the same distribution now, but of H1 by itself in nearby atomic clouds. And they've gotten this by isolating and subtracting the more distant H1 in the galaxy by just using a cosecant law for the distribution of column density, taking that out and what you're left with is stuff that's very local then. And that very local stuff you'll see has also an extended distribution. And these contours here show the limits of the, of the gas, one of the, one of the contours of the dark uh, uh, absorbing material that was not showing up in the linear estimates from H1 and CO. Putting those things together with the gamma ray emission, which also then is tracing this very cold or this very um, dark material, shall we say. They come up with finally with this map in galactic coordinates, which shows the column densities of dark gas found in these dust halos, measured from the gamma ray intensity and the reddening excess. Now this material here that you see is all, as I said, local stuff close to us at high latitude so that it's not messed up with low latitude material at much further distances. But this stuff is not, a, is not visible in the usual tracers um, of gas. And so it, 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 it's reasonably called dark gas. And, and their conclusion is given here at the end of their uh, abstract that the relation between the masses in the molecular, the dark, and the atomic phases in these local clouds implies a dark gas mass in the Milky Way, the entire Milky Way, comparable to the molecular gas. 
Now, it doesn't say what this material is because it's largely being found through the gamma rays. And I said the gamma rays don't care where, what sort of chemical state the nucleons are in. Um, they just tell you essentially the grammage per gram is per square centimeter of material. So there's a comparable amount of stuff out there that we didn't know about. We suspected, but there was no hard evidence. I think this is the first case of hard evidence. Well, it didn't take the theorists very long to come up with an idea as to what it could be. And uh, this paper by Wolfire, Hollaback, and McKee. Only five years. I'm sorry? Only five years. <laughs> Only five years. So yeah. Right. But I guess it is a long time, would you think? They should have done it faster. <laughs> In any case, this was the first paper I could find where there seemed to be a good explanation for it. And their proposal is that this gas is just, they used essentially standard ISM models for this. And perhaps the key uh, point here is that this gas is in low density envelopes and the molecules are destroyed by um, ultraviolet. And so those are the red lines. So this was the straightforward explanation for what this material was. It was essentially destroyed uh, molecule, molecular gas. Uh, the CO is photo dissociated and uh, uh, the absence of CO and other trace molecules explain why the gas itself doesn't show up. In the Fortunately, the observers had not read that paper. And they were not daunted by, uh, I guess even more fortunately, the time assignment committee hadn't read it either. <laughs> That's probably more relevant because these, this group, Cotton et al., uh, got time on a the Green Bag Telescope and uh, went out to observe a, a number of these high latitude dust clouds. This was is, uh, one called MBM 40, and they were mapping these clouds in OH, OH emission. They observed a large number of these, and they found in this paper, which was published in 2012, the hydroxyl emission was a tracer of the molecular hydrogen in the envelope. And, and I should just remind you that their result here from observations is that the OH line is an excellent tracer of gas at low extinction regions, which is just the place the theorists had said you wouldn't find molecules because they'd be destroyed. So that's why I said it was a good thing that that these uh, observers had not read that paper, and that, more importantly, that the committee had read that paper. So this, I think, brings up a lot of questions. It looks like OH, which is actually faint, but not hard to observe. We know about how to observe OH, and we've done it for quite some time, was a tracer for these low-density envelopes. Now, these questions then immediately intrude on our consciousness. How common are these low-density molecular envelopes and clouds? Perhaps there are more clouds in the galaxy that are all pretty well low-density. And, and does this relative abundance of the gas change with position in the galaxy? We don't even know that. They've just done this on one cloud. Now, what's the overall contribution of this dark gas? To the baryon content of the galaxy. And so that's the, the subject we're going to look at now. <clears throat> so I want to tell you about a, a little survey that we did now several years ago, but it just got into print last year um, by myself and a student from here, uh, Monica Rodriguez, from one of Lawrence's students, and uh, a couple of colleagues from Sweden. Um, this observation, it takes a lot of observing time. This is very faint stuff, as I'll explain and you'll see. There was no way we were going to get observing time at normal observatories for this. We needed hours, weeks, months of observing. Well, those of you who have been to Ansela in Sweden, 
we'll know that there's a 25 meter telescope there sitting out in the wind and the rain, which is used a order a week a month, perhaps even less, for European VLBI measurements. The rest of the time that telescope sits there looking rather forlornly at the ground. And um, it's measured the ground many, many times, nothing of which is very interesting, it turns out. But the receivers continue to operate, and they keep the electronics warm, and they make sure it runs because it has to be ready to go every uh, month for a few days. So they were, needless to say, delighted if we could find a reason to use this, and it turned out that they were able to observe OH with the receiver they had, or a pretty good receiver, actually, a pretty decent receiver. And so they, uh, the director, Roy Booth, kindly had uh, agreed to give us large amounts of observing time uh, for this project. Now, I won't describe how we got here because the project actually wasn't originally conceived of to do this experiment. We had the data, which we got for another purpose, and uh, we found a number of very unusual things, as you'll see, and we ended up scratching our heads in a perplexed way to try to figure out what it might, might all mean. And really that conclusion is what I'm telling you about today, but it wasn't the original motivation for doing it. The original motivation was a pretty decent standard, I would say, canonical study of a dust cloud. And so let me review a little bit of how this went. We picked a direction in the sky which didn't have bright carbon monoxide because we were specifically looking for low density presumably cool, but at least low-density gas. And carbon monoxide is a bad tracer for low-density gas. And so we wanted to be sure that we didn't have a lot of carbon monoxide uh, in, it, it wasn't this sort of dominating the radiation in that region. This is a map from Tom Dan's survey of giant molecular clouds in the galaxy. And uh, the direction we chose was in this direction in the outer galaxy. It's a good direction if you're interested in the, the sort of spatial structure because distance and velocity are linearly related in this direction in the galaxy and you can get an idea of sort of the filling factor, linear filling factors and so on of things. So that's why we chose it. So that's the first point I mentioned. The distance is nearly linearly correlated with, uh, related to the rate of velocity according to this and the line of sight, it's at plus five uh, latitude. So the line of sight goes essentially through the galaxy and then goes out of the galaxy at a distance of about one to two kiloparsec away. So it exits the disk beyond about 20 kilometers per second. And a, a modest total spectral coverage can provide path lengths of a few kiloparsec, which we wanted to have for this. And so we thought this should provide an idea of the 1D filling factor of this material. But this is the direction we looked at, and there was this dust cloud in Lens catalog. And again, I won't explain why uh, we picked that one, but it was one that uh, we thought we might find uh, OH emission around. And just to, as a matter of interest, we began with an observation of these five points by five points here, this 25-point grid. And we looked at where the OH emission was, the thermal OH emission at 1667. The one bad thing about the Onsala location is that it is still in a, not in a very radio quiet zone. In the 1665 line, we couldn't observe because of interference. In any case, we found OH emission at every place we looked. And I was disappointed by that because I wanted to use the positions in the corners as kind of baseline to subtract off the ambient from the emission we thought we were looking for in the cloud. So we expanded it to a seven by seven, which was essentially out here. And we still found profiles everywhere. And then we finally went to a nine by nine, which is the full grid you see, 81 points. And again, the profiles show no difference in the central part than in the outer parts here. So we think that this central thing in Lin's catalog, it just happens to be a, a nearby dust feature, which has enough stars behind it to look dark in the sky. 
but it's irrelevant for this uh, the, the results I'm about to show you. There is body CO in emission here. This particular observation is taken from um, Tom Dame's observation, the survey that what Dame did of the southern and northern hemisphere. And uh, he has kindly provided us with uh, sm smooth results of this. this. This survey has an angular resolution of about eight arc minutes. And our angular resolution for the OH observation is about 30 arc minutes. So we needed some smoothing of the data. And so this has all been fairly heavily smoothed in order to uh, resemble. And you can see that there are a lot of places where we don't see very much here, but there's places where we do see profiles kind of scattered through. This particular spot right here happens to be where um, sharpest 140 is. There's, this is a, a shell type H2 region uh, caused by a couple of B stars that are heating the outside of the surface of this molecular cloud. And it produces very warm, uh, dense CO emission, and uh, is the reason for why we see all of this stuff in this particular area. So it is related to star formation, but by essentially a secondary process where the CO is being warmed and uh, it's dense in the uh, like in the dust cloud. This is OH. I don't think it takes much guesswork to see that there's pretty well OH everywhere you look. And it's a little funny because we obviously are stretched out here. Let me go back to, I think the H1 is the next. These are the Dwingolo profiles in the entire area. So you can see, and these all look the same. The H1 is pretty clearly optically thick everywhere local. It's all up there around 80 or 90 Kelvin, roughly. So it's pretty well optically thick everywhere. But I want you to look at the velocity range. Look at the range and what the typical profile, you're kind of tails off at the edge of the window. You go back to the OH. Now what you see in the OH, these are pretty ratty profiles because even with three hours of integration per pixel, three hours of integration per pixel, we still have signal-to-noise ratios that are still very modest. Nevertheless, when we see something, it does have this feature that it's sort of there, and then it disappears where the OH, where the H1 is disappearing. So this was this really looked startling to us, and we weren't quite sure what to, to do about it. And it took us a while to actually get this observation was made, I think, in 2006. It took us a while to get up the intestinal fortitude to write a paper. We eventually did, and I'm glad, um, because I think it's turning out to be rather more interesting than we even suspected. So the OH is different. I've got a couple of slides here just to let you see. I'll blink between them. You can do your own visual analysis. Why don't you just try to make a guess as to what the overall fraction of pointings is where you see OH but no CL. We'll come back to this. Okay. Now let's take a closer look at a few of these profiles just to try to understand what it is we're seeing. Here's a mosaic from those five positions that are contiguous at that particular survey location in. in uh, in the sky. This is the H1, as I said, very boring. It all looks the same. I'm sure it isn't the same if it wasn't optically thick, but it sure looks the same here. What we see in OH looks like this. It's ratty stuff. As I said, bad signal to noise. We'd love to have one. Here's CO. Peak here, maybe something there. Another peak here, maybe something there. Peak here, not so sure anymore. And here, I don't think so. So let's just have a close look at these three features, one, two, three, and this one out here, four. And we're going to try to estimate, and this is at this moment, just an estimate, as you will see as we go along. This can be done much more 
precisely with a little bit more work, but this is what I could do uh, in order to get this talk together for you. So we're going to look at the, the, what we can tell about the molecular gas from the CO as a tracer and the OH as a tracer in these pixel in these particular position, pixel positions. Well, the standard way, of course, we know of doing measurements of the H2 column from CO is, is using the famous or infamous X factor CO. And it would say that if you take the brightness temperature T multiplied by delta V in these units, and then this coefficient in front, you can get the column density of molecular gas in that direction in the galaxy as measured by CO. Well, this X factor, many of you know, is based ultimately on the virial theorem, and it's the topic of a lot of grumbling uh, amongst many people, both observers and theorists, as to what, how precise it really is, and does it vary at one place to another in the galaxy. So what can we do with, with OH? Now, the standard way of dealing with OH is to get the column density of OH from the radio spectroscopy and use an assumed abundance to get the H2 column. Well, of course, that can change from one place to another in the galaxy, and we're not really sure about what the assumed abundance is, but it's a way which has been used. I want to tell you about another way, which I think is quite exciting and offers more options uh, with new different problems, but it's a more direct way. And um, it, it makes use of absorption line spectroscopy that's been obtained with a combination of uh, uh, H2 results using Copernicus and Fuse to give you column densities of H2 and absorption for nearby bright stars, B stars, most of them, and results on ground-based uh, spectroscopy using the UVES instrument for OH at about 3,000 angstroms. This is just barely what you can do from the ground, but it has been done, and there's a paper by Veselak et al., and there's more results coming along. And here's the way it works. If you look at, at the, at the uh, uh, half a dozen stars which have been observed here, uh, the interstellar H2 columns measured in, in, in the usual absorption lines of, uh, from directly from H2, and the column inferred from OH here, there is a linear relationship between these two. So the trick is to say, look, this, now I don't need to have an inf uh, ultraviolet absorption measurement for that. That I can measure with my radio emission measurement. Same thing. Now, there's a little problem here with excitation temperature. But in any case, in order to get the OH column, you need to know an excitation temperature for OH. And that's another question. So this particular approach has its difficulties. But nevertheless, if you can estimate the OH column using the radio, you can get the H2 directly from UV absorption. And you don't have to then assume anything about burial theorem or anything. I was clear that the data here in that plot I just showed you, they're pretty sparse, and, but they're very tantalizing. Let me just back up and show you. There's really only a couple of points that you can believe down here. They have reasons why they don't like this point. Um, and then there's this one up here which hangs everything on it, essentially. So it's pretty bad right now. But it's clear that more could be done. And if the motivation is there, I'm sure that it will be done. So I think that the number of observations that are going to be done in the solar neighborhood, and these are also all stars that are not very far away. They're within a couple of kiloparsecs. Because of the, otherwise you can't measure the UV absorption. OK. So if this correlation eventually does prove to be robust, we have a direct measure of NH2 from the 18 centimeter OH line emission. And so this is essentially an X factor for OH done in a rather different way, but not involving assumptions about dynamic equilibrium. And this is the X factor right there. That's it. 
So this proves to be useful. We can at least see what happens there. We'll look at these three uh, features here, one, two, three, and four, I guess, four in a different spot. And we'll just ask ourselves, how, what do we get when we calculate? What kind of numbers do we get? Here's one, two, three, and four. And so these are the characteristics of the profiles, the brightness temperature um, uh, in OH, the brightness temperature in CO, the delta V for both of them, and what you get from the OH and the, and the CO. And so this one is low by a factor of five. This one here, well, we're not sure because there's only an upper limit for the CO here, but it's actually a decent, it's not as though it's nothing. There is something. So these are probably only a factor two off. And this one here has, again, some numbers which are maybe similar as well. So outside of the bright one here, the other two are not so bad, so that the measurements that we're doing with OH of specific features that also show CO emission in a narrow velocity range are not so bad. I'm not saying they're great, and it's clear that a much better or thorough analysis needs to be done, but it's encouraging. But now I want you to notice that at the bottom, feature number four, which was the one further off to the right, is clearly measurable in OH at 15 millik. There's nothing in CO, undetectable. It has a broad velocity range over the whole range that we covered, about 10 kilometers per second. And the ratio here is about five. I should say the X factor number that we get for OH column is five by 10 to the 20th. Undetected in CO. This is a pixel where there's molecular gas that is not showing up in CO. All right. Now, so I challenged you when we started this to look at some statistics. I want you then again to look one more time at it. Here's the CO and the OH, CO, the OH. Don't you get a rough feeling for what, how many pixels may have the CO emission versus those in OH? Well, this is what I found when I did this calculation. There are 81 survey positions, nine by nine, the number showing no CO emission at the level of detection we have here. At the present sensitivity, there's 25 of them. The number of positions showing OH emission, as far as I can tell, is pretty well all of them. There may be one or two. Thanks, I'm about done. Well, one or two that might miss. The typical um, column density of CO at, 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 I should say, of H2, at places where with detectable CO is something like 8 to 10 by 10 to the 20th in compact compounds, three kilometers or so wide. The typical OH uh, measured column density of H2 at all the survey positions is about 5 by 10 to the 20th in each position. That's in extended compounds. So now we, we can just multiply these numbers together, right? 81 times this one and 25 times that one. And what we get is just a pretty blunt measurement. But over the entire survey area, we have a total columns that we have measured column lengths all through back to back, if you like, of 5 by 10 to the 22 measured at the H2 column measured by CO and 4 by 10 to the 22 in H2 measured in OH. Well, this begins to look rather a lot like, um, like the measurement that Grenier told us about. The sky, we find that the, the, the columns that we're getting of, 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 of gas the H2 columns, I think this is a summary that I could more or less get through here. That about 10% of the compact OH features actually show CO emission. Not many of them. But when they do, the numbers we get are not dissimilar from what you'd expect using the OH X factor. When they don't, the CO molecules, they're either absent 
or the three millimeter emission is not sufficiently excited to be observable. And over the survey area, the OH emission implies that there's about twice as much molecular gas in the galaxy as revealed by CO. And this gas is more widely distributed. It's generally distributed much more like the H1. And I think this agrees with the Grenier et al. result. Of course, I'm not sure that they're completely associated. But, you know, they say in the U.S. that if it, if it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, and it, and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So I think currently we're thinking that this is the same duck that we're looking at. There's some new questions, things we need to do, because this is all a very tentative thing I've shown you. OH and H1 appear to coexist in the galaxy. But we don't know anything about the relative abundances in the inner versus the outer galaxy. And I think all bets are off about using CO in this story. I think the idea that there's a particular change in radial distribution of gas, I think that is now up for grabs. This needs to be examined further with significantly more extensive OH surveys of something that's very difficult to observe. I will mention here that this widespread molecular component is the thing that I've been looking for for a number of years because I had an idea that most of the H1 in the galaxy was actually a ordered dissociation product and I was roundly criticized by people that said, well, but there's no CO emission there, there's no molecule. I think we found the molecules that will do that, but that's a different colloquium that I'd be happy to give some other time. I want to thank my many friends and colleagues here in Morelia for the invitation to join these festivities, and I wish you all many more decades of accomplishment in the future. And this will be continued if the time assignment committees are sympathetic. We have to start looking under some different rocks. Uh, Grenier's original results were based on uh, Egret instrument yes. on, on board the late uh, Compton satellite. Yes. But now we have much better gamma ray surveys of the sky with Fermi and Adjaye. Yes. Uh, are uh, her results change in no. the light of this new observation? I, I have those references even in my bag, actually. And they're very good. The, the work that's coming out is amazing. But it, it didn't supersede this. It's supported everything that she said, and her paper has some very pretty pictures, so that's why I used it. <laughs> it was an all-sky result, her paper. Much of what's been done now has been more localized. So, Ron, the CO line profiles are always significantly narrow, right? Yes. Even compensating for the fact that the mass of the molecule is different. Not all that different right? now with OH, but, but yeah. But H1 and OH, OH, of course, com comparable CO. So, uh, most likely, these are not spatially coextensive. Actually, I mean, you could argue that. And they may not be. But the velocities are the same. The mean velocities of the features are the same. Well, that's that like... That doesn't prove anything. Right. I mean, that's just like raisins being inside the I'm not muffin, disagreeing right? with you. Yeah. I'm saying what the data tells us right now, that we can tell you how far away they are, and they're both about the same distance, and they're in the beam. Mm -hmm. But more details, we don't know. This is a half degree um, measurement. What we would really like to do is study these at the full resolution of the CO. And, and I'll just show you a couple of examples of that. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. This is better. Uh, I've had to enhance the picture so you can even see it. This shows here, um, these are GBT observations, compared directly with full resolution OH observations from Tom Day. And th this is the, the CO, I'm sorry, full resolution CO observations. This is what Dame's CO profiles look like. There's a little glitch here. This is what we see in OH. So this piece here coincides with that one. 
this bump here, there is no compound. Right. Right. So, so, so I, what I was wondering is, is it possible that the more extensive, in my mind, on the OH stuff, you can't quite see the CO because the CO to H2 ratio is built upon the virial equilibrium, right? Because the CO line is thick and we can't quite do the ratio except by assuming that the virial theorem holds. Well. Yes. So if you are in a part of the cloud where the virial theorem doesn't hold, yes. then the column density would not be measured properly, right? I'm sure you're right. But I'm not sure that that means that, how am I going to put this? I don't think it takes, it, it removes the fact that the CO is an unreliable indicator of the amount of gas that we're seeing along lines of sight. These cold envelopes that are around clouds that we see that the cotton at all originally saw, which we are seeing now in a much more widespread phenomenon throughout, you know, over kiloparsecs in the galaxy. Um, I mean, most of the, don't forget that the, the focus up till now, and the history here is very interesting in astronomy because, of course, the first observations that were done of OH were looking for it in absorption. And it was only when the anomalous emission was found that the whole army started marching off up that hill rather than this hill. And there were a few diehards like Carl Heilitz and many people who I have a whole slide with names of people who continued to work on dust clouds. But the, the conclusion was clear that by the time we got to the 70s, the early 70s, that everybody felt that the only place that you could find these, this emission in OH was in dark dust clouds. And so the surveys always were focused on dust clouds. So that was why I find this survey so different. I mean, we, we were not specifically focusing on a dust cloud. We were just looking in the galaxy. And we see this stuff everywhere. Most of this stuff is low density, right? But you could also use OH in high density regions? Well, um, I guess the answer is yes, you could. It, my, I'm not quite sure why we don't see it in higher density regions, but when we do see it, it always seems to be coming from these apparently low density regions that are more associated with the H1. The densities are more characteristic of H1 than they are with O. I mean, it's not perhaps surprising that if we had a, a tracer for molecules that was going to be low density, that's what we would expect to find, that it would be distributed more or less like the H1. And the, the, um, the critical density for OH at 18 centimeters is down around 10 per cubic centimeter, which is still higher than H1. That's more like 1 per cubic centimeter. But nevertheless, there's a lot more of the galaxy that's characteristic of 10 per cubic centimeter than there is that's characteristic of 3 or 400 per cubic centimeter, which is the critical density for CO. Concerning your uh, your a concern about uh, whether you needed to have the molecular gas in order for there to be atomic gas, thinking that the yes. atomic is, uh, is the product of the photo dissociation. Yes. Um, I think it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem here, because uh, in our pictures, uh, we continuously think that the, the molecular gas is forming out of the H1. Yes. And so in that sense, you wouldn't really need any any agent to dissociate the molecular gas in order to get the atomic, but rather we have the opposite problem of having large enough column densities in, in the gas in order to allow molecules to form. So in that sense, um, I like very much the picture of there being extended molecular but non-CO uh, halos around the clouds, mm -hmm. but in, indeed the H1 might as it might as well be the dominant component uh, in the in the disk. So um, why why would you need to have an atomic component? Well, you don't I, need, I, sorry, well, an electric component. I mean, we do see it. That's the answer. I think perhaps the short answer is mm -hmm. apparently it's there. Uh, we might not have needed it before, but as I said, I had been many times <laughs> criticized by people who said, "Well, you know, if it's photo dissociation, why don't we see any CL?" I think we know why, why we didn't see CO now. The densities are low. And there is a molecular component that can be seen there. Mm 
that generally lives with the H1. Mm -hmm. But the actual ratio is bound to depend on many other factors. And we, I mean, this is early days where we really need to understand a lot more about the structure of these boundaries between the two. Mm -hmm. 